Greetings my fair folks and welcome back to Bumblebee for today's video on the top 10 unholy things European kings did. And how about we start off at number 10 with the most unheard of king, King Stephen. Despite seemingly flying under the radar of history, Stephen was king of England from 1135 to 1154 and he proved to be very bad at it. Unsurprisingly, he also wasn't meant to be king and his determination to hold that role is what caused over a decade of civil war. In the fourth year of Stephen's reign, Empress Matilda, his cousin, came from England intent on claiming the throne for herself. As the daughter of Henry I, she expected to be queen, not just because her father arranged it in his will, but also because he made the court, including Stephen, swear an oath of loyalty to Matilda. But since she was a woman, the second her father died, the royal court essentially laughed in her face, and Stephen got the leeway to steal the throne. His first mistake is, rather than trying to capture Matilda when she arrives, Stephen allows her to travel to Bristol, where she builds a rebellion over several years. This was already a time of social upheaval in Stephen's kingdom. To quote the Anglo-Saxon chronicle of the time, in the days of this king there was nothing but strife, evil, and robbery, for quickly the great man who were traitors rose against him. The inability to lead politically left greedy nobility's access to building unlicensed castles and manors and ruling the populace with violence. Stephen and Matilda's armies meet in February of 1141, and while her forces win and Stephen's in prison for a short duration, the people of England refuse to accept her or respect her as queen. Once Stephen set free in secret, he retained the crown, whilst his rival Matilda literally has to reluctantly just return to Normandy in 1148. Stephen never did relinquish his crown, but his rightful heir Matilda does get the last lap when her son Henry succeeds Stephen. We'll call him by his nickname. Number nine is the Do Nothing. What is a Do Nothing King? Well, it's exactly what it sounds like. Louis IV, for example, ruled for a single year, and unlike his predecessor, he seems to have had absolutely no ambition, no interest in politics, and didn't do anything that the chroniclers found worth mentioning. This isn't the first case of a do-nothing king. The last kings of the Merovingians line were similar, as was China's Emperor Wan Li. Crowned king of Aquitaine in 979 while his father was still alive, you'd think the pressure to be would be on to impress dad, but no. Louis never succeeded in his efforts to retake Aquitaine and try the Archbishop of Reims for treason. He married, but had no heirs because his wife Adelaide ran away and he disregarded his mother's advice to befriend the German king Otto III. And then he died in a hunting accident at age 20 with no legitimate heirs, which ushered in the Capetian line of French monarchs. Number 8 is everyone's favorite glutton, the Magna Carta King. If you remember your middle school history, you'll know what I'm talking about. John, King of England, who ruled from 1199 to 1216. John was an efficient and capable administrator at the very least, but he was also unpredictable, impulsive, and aggressive i.e. before becoming king, John had already betrayed and rebelled against his father, Henry II, and his brother, Richard I. Then once he was king, he immediately took to imprisoning opponents, regularly taking prisoners and imposing ruthless punishments. John used his income to fund his expensive wars in France, but he still failed to hold together the empire created by his father and lost Normandy. Yet he still felt comfortable in exploiting feudal rights enough to extort money from the barons. He set taxes obscenely high and enforced all kinds of arbitrary fines as well as seize the Baron's estates. This all culminates with the English subjects rebelling and forcing him to sign the Magna Carta in June of 1215, although he tried to annul it literally immediately. And when that is granted by Pope Innocent III, which doesn't seem like a very innocent thing to do, in August of 1215, it led to the renewal of the Barional Revolt, which was still raging when John died in October 1216. Over to Denmark for number 7, Christian the Tyrant. Christian II was crowned King of Sweden on November 4th of 1520 after winning a war against the rebel Swedish nobleman headed by Stenster the Younger, who wanted to secede from the Kalmar Union. To celebrate, a three-day coronation feast was held for all. And then 82 people promised amnesty were then put to death by beheading in the storage at Square of Galmastan in a mass wipeout of nobility and bishops. The traditional Swedish interpretation of the story is that the Archbishop Trolle had been forced to give Christian information that he could use to crush the Swedish opponents in return for amnesty. According to his story, Historian Loritz Weibel, on the other hand, it was Troll and other Swedish clergy who they themselves initiated the events leading up to the deaths by accusing a number of Troll's own personal opponents and Swede nobility of heresy, after which point Christian II began a 
a lawsuit against those people, which ultimately would have to end with death because canon law at the time said that was the punishment for heresy. It was only after the deaths and his expulsion from Denmark and Sweden that Christian turned into a boogeyman, partly as a result of a successful smear campaign mounted by Gustav Vasa, the founder of the Swedish state. Irregardless, he did kill all those people. We've talked about it before, but it'll never be too many times. Number six is the odd wig. It was discussed in the recent Bumblebee video top 10 uncommon royal family hygiene tricks, how King Charles II was a special kind of creep. See, plucking someone's down their hair as a souvenir was a tradition amongst the libertines of the 17th century. What was not a tradition was making a damn wig of them. When the hedonistic Charles II visited Scotland back in the 1600s, he was taken to copious drinking parties with lots of attentive ladies present, especially at Castle Drill in Fife, Scotland. Years later, he sent his Scottish bros a thank you for the raunchy party times, and it was a wig woven from his favorite lovers down their hairs. And man, you'd think he'd sent them some kind of uber sentimental mixtape handcrafted by Fife's own longtime crush, because the men's club revered it like it was their own child. It was even passed on to the younger generation after the castle keeper Earl of Moray passed away. Eventually it was stolen and came to be used in the rights of a local adult activity club called the Beggar's Benison, who believed it would pass on royal virility. Alright, back to doom and gloom. It's number 5, Rudolf II. One of the most eccentric rulers of the European Renaissance, Holy Roman Emperor Rudolf II reigned from 1552 until 1612 and was perhaps the greatest collector of his time. As an enthusiastic patron of the arts, sciences, and pseudosciences, he filled his Prague castle with obscure junk like taxidermies, cabinets of curiosities, and alchemy products. And let's not forget, Homie essentially had a literal barn in the house with lions and tigers, a dodo bird, even an orangutan lived inside. Throughout his life, however, the eccentric Rudolf struggled with mania, fluctuating through its highs and its lows. Sometimes he literally hid from his royal court for weeks on end, or only spoke in an audible voice, or allegedly. He gave generous support to the astronomers Tycho Brahe and Johannes Kepler, helping lay the foundation of the scientific revolution, but it was because he was positively obsessed with alchemy and spent his life trying to find the elusive philosopher's stone. And of course, most famous Famously, Rudolf very casually ushered in the start of the Thirty Year War, which devastated Central Europe for decades and left Germany in ruins. On to number four is Emperor Andronikos. So this Byzantine emperor was downright bloodthirsty. To quote the man himself, I shall fall upon your family like a lion pouncing on large prey, and I shall exact fitting revenge for the injuries I have sustained at your hands. And that's actually what he did. After having spent years imprisoned by his own family members, Andro would work his way back to power in Byzantine and eliminate almost all of his imperial family. His two year reign was marked by numerous adult liaisons, many of which were with relatives, but also his increasing paranoia creating a state of terror for everybody. One historian describes Andros as a man of violence, cruelty, mutilation, and death, which is pretty damn accurate seeing as Andro literally blinded so many people he earned himself the nickname Hater of Sunlight. On September 11th of 1185, the angry mob of Constantinople decided they wanted to select a new emperor. You know you have to be bad for a whole king to one day collectively wake up, walk outside, see the sun, hear the birds, and Jen just collectively decide yeah, we've got to absolutely go and dogpile this dude. Andro and his wife Agnes and his mistress, gotta bring the mistress, I'm sure his lo wife loved that, tried to escape the mob in a boat. The wind worked against them, however, and Andro spent the next three days being brutally tormented by his people. They cut off his right hand, knocked out his teeth, pulled out his hair, gouged out his eyes, and even threw boiling water in his face, all before ripping the man limb from limb. Let's get biblical. Number three is King Herod. So, one of the most notoriously evil kings in history. Born in 73 BCE and crowned king by 40 BCE, Harold wasted no time building a reputation for ruthlessness and cruelty, ordering the deaths of any political opponents, perceived threats, or just generally anyone he felt should die. Harold was also known to have numerous affairs and have several children out of wedlock. To quote History Cooperative, economically there are mixed interpretations whether Judea prospered during his reign or not. His extensive building projects are dismissed as being vanity projects, but there's no denying that they are great monuments that still stand as proof of the greatness of this old Roman province. His people were heavily taxed for these projects, but they also provided large scale employment for many. Thus King Herod is a controversial figure to modern scholars and for plenty of other reasons too. But 
but this king is unholy in the perfect definition of the word. This is the king who was so threatened by the foretold birth of Yeshua that he famously made the call for death in Bethlehem to try and prevent it. The man, the myth, the monstrous legacy. Number two is King Leopold II. I talked about the cruel king in the recent video Unbearable Living Conditions of the Past You Wouldn't Believe and I feel mentioning that title alone tells you how bad this man probably was. He was king of Belgium from 1865 to 1909 and during that time he bought Congo. Like privately owned, purchased the land and therefore all the people on it in an example of corrupted governance so shocking I struggle to comprehend it. Consequently, Leopold was responsible for the death of millions of people in the Congo Free State. He was determined to exploit the area for its natural resources such as rubber, ivory and minerals and to do so, he created a system of forced labor that led to the brutal accidental and exhaustion death of Congolese people. And because that wasn't bad enough, Leopold taxed the Congolese beyond rationale. It was so oppressive that it caused widespread famine, disease and dehydration. Any form of dissent was answered with a death sentence and Leopold was sure to use oppressive measures to control his people. His reign of terror finally ended in 1908 when the Belgian government took control of the Congo Free State after the other European nations woke up to the tragedies occurring there and forced action. To this day, he's remembered as one of the most evil kings in history and there is public demand for the removal of monuments for this horrible man. And coming in at number one, we have Kaiser Wilhelm II. And at the least, he's remembered as Queen Victoria's first grandchild. At the most, he's the dude that led Germany into the First World War. When Wilhelm became emperor in 1888 at 29 years old, he was determined to be seen as tough and powerful. There is only one person who is master in this empire and I am not going to tolerate any other, Wilhelm liked to say, even though Germany was a democracy. Wilhelm remained convinced he was amazing at, despite all evidence to the contrary, personal diplomacy. He loved to set up foreign policy meetings with other European monarchs and statesmen. In fact, Wilhelm could do neither the personal nor the diplomacy part. And these meetings rarely went well. He called the diminutive King Victor Emmanuel III of Italy a dwarf to the king's own entourage. He called Prince Ferdinand of Bulgaria Fernando Naso on account of the fact he had a beaky nose. And even once in 1909, Kaiser slapped him on the butt in public and refused to apologize. Ferdinand was so angry he gave a valuable arms contract to the French instead of the Germans. In 1890, he let lapse a long-standing defensive agreement with Russia, assuming Russia was so desperate for German good that they would keep it dangling. Instead, Russia immediately made alliance with France instead. On top of that, the man would just wing all his speeches. The Kaiser used other people in instrumental terms and was a compulsive liar and seemed to have limited understanding of cause and effect. In fact, Wilhelm wasn't good at understanding much of anything. The general staff of the German army agreed that Kaiser couldn't lead three soldiers over a gutter. To add to the confusion, Wilhelm changed his political and personal position every five minutes based on whoever he was talking to at that moment. He was more suggestible than a two-year-old. So Wilhelm's own staff and ministers had to resort to manipulation, distraction, and flattery to manage him. We've reached the end of another video. Thank you, thank you so much for your time and I hope you enjoyed. Be sure to like and subscribe if you want to see more from us. And until next time, drop a comment below on what kind of topics you'd like to see us cover soon.